Amen, amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. The Lord is extremely good, you know, to bring us here in another session of Bible study one more time. Let me take this time out to, first of all, welcome, you know, all that is tuning in. You know, we pray that, you know, the Lord will somehow speak to your heart today. Let me also apologize for the missing of the stream last week. You know, we had some technical difficulties, but, you know, God is a good God, and God worked out for us that we might have Bible study this week. Amen. So, before we proceed, let us... You know, breathe a word of prayer, and then we, you know, get into it. Lord, we come before you one more time. We magnify your name. We adore you today. There is none like you, none beside you, none to even be compared to you. We thank you for this privilege to be here to share in our word. We pray that you will touch each and every person that tunes in. We ask you to just be with us and be in our midst. And we pray, God, that as we break bread tonight, that your will be done and that your will be accomplished. God, we dedicate this Bible study to you and we give you thanks right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Amen, bless the Lord. So we have been looking at the topic, you know, the rejected and the accepted kings. And, you know, we've been going for a couple of weeks. And our key scripture is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 15, from 16 to 28. Our key verse is verse 26, right? And we are just going to read our key verse tonight. And then we will do a bit of recap on, on what we have done the previous week. And then we will get into, you know, what we have to say. Amen. So let us look at the key verse. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 26. Amen. First Samuel chapter 15 and verse 26. And it really says that, you know, Samuel, after he, you know, um, confronted Saul because Saul had disobeyed the commandment of the Lord, you know, Samuel was saying that, you know, I will not return with you. So here is it now. Let us just read it. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. So as we look back a little bit of recap, we want to start by looking at the dialogue between Saul and Samuel from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 12 through to 13. And when, Samuel, and when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Come to Carmel. And behold, he set him up a place, and is gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the Lord's commandment. Now, in our previous week, we have, we have discussed, we have discussed and said that, you know, the Lord gave Samuel, Saul, a task, and he said, go and destroy the Amalekites. Go and destroy the Amalekites. Go and destroy Amalek. Utterly destroy Amalek. You know, I remember when my people came out of Egypt, what they did, and the Lord gave him a task. He said, go and utterly destroy. Now, Israel went down to Amalek, and instead of utterly destroying, because the Lord says, save nothing, he said, infant, man, woman, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, ass, he said, Everything you're supposed to destroy, destroy everything, leave nothing alive. But Saul, we said, wanted to do his own thing, right? And instead of obeying the commandment of the Lord, 
Saul wanted his own way. And we quoted the scripture in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, which says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. And we have seen where Saul wanted his own way. He, he was at the point where, I, I don't know if it was the kingship that got to him, but he was pressing to do his own thing, right? And here we read now where he met the man of God. The man of God came and he ran out and met the man of God and he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Saul did not kill Agag, king of Amalek. He did not utterly destroy the, 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 the animals that the Lord commanded him to. As a matter of fact, the Bible said he and the children of Israel saved the things that were good. So the sheep that was good, the, the goats and all of that, the king saved those. And yet he came out to see the prophet and said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have done the Lord's command. So he came excited. Blessed be thou, Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. 1 Samuel 15, 14 to 15. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. I want us to make note here of the scripture, right? When, when Saul gave his response, he said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, because come next week we'll be going back to the scripture and we'll be have a, we will have a comparison between David's response to his sin and Saul's response to his sin. So you can just mark mental, a mental note of the scripture. But he said they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people speared the best of the sheep and of the ox, oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. So the king now blamed the people. The king blamed the people. It was the people that brought the best of the spoils from the Amalekites. to so sacrifice unto the Lord. This was the king in earlier chapter we said that gave an adoration and said, If anyone eats anything until it is evening, then, until I be avenged of my enemy, that person will be put to death. And the people obeyed him, even though it caused the people to sin. The people obeyed him. This tells us then that if Saul had gave the commandment and said, look here, destroy everything. If he had said to the people, destroy everything, then you know that the people would obey him. So the Bible was right when it said, Saul and the people save the best to sacrifice unto the Lord. So if he had simply said, kill everything, the people would have obeyed him. But he was more interested in pleasing himself than pleasing the Lord. Anytime you find a person not willing to accept their wrong, they will not receive forgiveness because a person have to first accept that they are in the wrong. A person must first accept that, you know, they are a sinner and then come to God with repentance. So anytime you find a person not willing to accept they are wrong, anytime you, you, you find a person doing their own thing and they say that it is right, you mark such a person. So now when we look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, 16 to 21, let us find that 1 Samuel chapter 15, 16 to 21. So the prophet asked him, what meaneth this, the bleating of the sheep and the oxen? And 
he blamed the people. But listen to what Samuel, Samuel said unto Saul, stay and I will tell thee what the Lord had said to me this night. And he said unto him, say on. And Samuel said, when thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then didst thou not obey, verse 19, where, when didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord has sent me, and have brought Agag, king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoils, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Let us go back to the slide. So, like, like I said in previous week, if this is not delusional, I don't know what is. Because the man was now being confronted after the prophet heard the bleating of the sheep and the oxen. The, the man was now being confronted. And even when the prophet told him, you did not carry out the command of the Lord, he said, yes, I did. He said, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. If the Amalekites were utterly destroyed, then what was King Agag doing there alive? If the animals were utterly destroyed, what was the sheep and the oxen doing there? But the king looks at the prophet and said, look here, it was the people. This was the second time that he was saying it was the people, you know. The man refused to accept that he was in the wrong. He further blamed the people that it was the people that took these animals to sacrifice unto the Lord. When he was confronted, he blamed the people. The people took the spoils, he said, right? So if a man cannot see himself as a sinner, then he will not turn from his sinful ways unto the Lord. And this is a challenge we said that we have when we witness um, the based on what is happening now, and we see the hearts of men are becoming even more desperately wicked. When we set out to witness, it is very hard to get an individual to see himself as a sinner. And that is needed if the person is going to first repent. And the Bible says without repentance, he will all likewise perish. So it's hard in this time, that is why we have to pray and say, Lord, send me worthy of repentance so that when we go to them and we give them the word of God, they will see themselves as a sinner and be willing to accept the Lord. So let, let us look at First Samuel 22, no, 15, 22, and 23. And Samuel said, had the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearten than the fats of ram. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So, like we've been saying, if he cannot see his fault, 
right? If he cannot see himself as a sinner, then he will not be willing to turn from his sinful ways. And the king refused to accept that he was disobedient. The king refused to accept that he was disobedient, right? And the prophet let him know that disobedience to God's command is as the sin of witchcraft. And we said that witchcraft is like going to the older man. It is like going to the four eye man to say, boy, tell me my future. So all these things that we see on TV that, you know, persons can say, they, they can't tell you about your future and they can't tell you about this. You have to be careful. Like if you go to these persons, it's just like going to that place to get a bath. And I want to warn the people of God that the prophet said to be disobedient. You see, when you know to do right and you, you continue in your wrong, I want you to understand that it, it is as witchcraft. And we said in previous weeks that it was when sin get out of hand that that was, is when God acted. It was the same thing in Genesis when God looked down and saw the sins of men. God acted and the sin of Saul came before the Lord. Right? Because here the disobedience that he did, it was willful, it was spiteful. And it was at as witchcraft, and the Lord acted. So it is better to obey God's word. Can you imagine the Lord convict us through the Holy Spirit, and we refuse to obey? It is better to obey, you know, the prodding of the Lord, and we're going to get down to it, you know, because we need to understand that when God talks to us and when God directs us as individuals, our conscience is supposed to be alive. And when we look at the life of David, we are going to see that the, the man's conscience was alive. Some of the, the thing that we would look on as nothing, David did it and it smote his heart. And we're going to get in there. But I want to tell us that we must have a life conscience because this is how God will, will direct us. When our conscience is alive, the word of God will abide in us. And, and the word that is within us will, through the conscience, direct us on the path that we should go. So the king, even though he was wrong, tried to justify. He tried to justify his disobedience to the Lord's command. How can an individual know what is right, try to justify their wrongdoing? He was stubborn and set in his own way. The prophet said unto him also, King, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Stubbornness is to persist in sin. This is what he was doing. To justify it and to plead for it. What the prophet was simply saying to the king, it's simply the Saul, you willfully disobey the commandment of the Lord. And Saul made his decision knowing that what he was doing is wrong and was guilty of rebellion against God. His disobedience was willful. It was preemptory to the commandment of the Lord. So we might think that this will be in the word of God is simple. And we might say, look here, I will do the thing, do the wrong thing right now, and next week I will do it right. It don't work like that. I want us to understand that obedience to the command of the Lord, to the word of the Lord, is extremely important. And when we look at the rest of the scripture, we recognize that punishment was handed out, right? The, the Bible said, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he had also rejected me from being king, right? The first time Saul disobeyed, the punishment was that, you know, your kingdom will not last. But here we see where the Bible says that the kingdom shall be taken from you and give to another, give to your neighbor. 
So it was at this time when Saul hear this that he came to the point and said, forgive me because I have done wrong. It was not until he heard this that the kingdom was going to be taken from him that he, that he accepted and said, look here. And it, it, it wasn't an acceptance from the heart, you know. But he just spoke it and said, I have done wrong. Turn with me. And the prophet said, I will not turn with thee. So David also did wrong, and we're going to get there. But because David knew and he saw the end of Saul, and he saw how miserable Saul was, when he was confronted, he said, look here, cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. The rejection, the rejection from, the rejection, the rejection from, from, from being king, the rejection from being king, the rejection from being king meant that Saul, the spirit of the Lord, would leave, would leave Saul. It meant that the spirit of the Lord would depart from, from him. So he was now dry and miserable. Moreover, the Bible said that, they, that an evil spirit came and attached himself to Saul. So because David saw it, David said, look here, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. So the rejection was a serious one and it meant that the Lord would depart from, from him. So let us Continue with verse 24 of 1 Samuel chapter 15. And Saul said unto Samuel, For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy word because I fear the people and obey their voice. The man is still trying to justify his wrong, you know. Again, he put it on the people that he feared the people. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord had rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold on the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord had rent the kingdom of Israel, from thee this day and had given it into given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. Nothing about repentance in this, you know. It was not until he heard that the kingdom would be ruined from him. That is the time he acknowledged. But there is nothing about repentance here. He said, I pray thee before the elders of my people and before Israel, turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Nothing sincere here. Let us go back to the slide. So it was not until he heard that, you know, the kingdom would be rent, would rent from him that he decided and said, look here, I, 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 I am sin. Turn with me that I may worship the Lord. But there was nothing about repentance in it. So from this point, so from this point, King Saul, 
King Saul, Saul's life took a turn for the worse, right? He was fearful of Goliath. Demonstrated a lack of trust in God. He was jealous and angry. Anger overtook him. He was not in control of his emotion or spoke rational. And you can see the scripture for that. He tried to murder David and Jonathan, his son. And he spent the rest of his life trying to kill David. So, Saul had no respect for the Lord's anointed. Right? Saul recognized that the spirit of the Lord was on David. But he did not respect that. Right? Instead of serving and protecting the people, he spent the rest of his life trying to kill David so that David would not be king. King Saul was a man with the stature of a king, but the characteristics of a man who did not know the Lord, he ended up acting like the kings of the nation that were around them. It was the people that asked for a king, and the first king that Israel got, got a, was a king that reflected the heart of the people. So let us now look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 through to 13. So David here, we look at David was anointed king from a young age, right? And we are going to look at, you know, Eliab, you know, look like a kingly material. So 1 Samuel chapter 16. And the Lord said unto Samuel, how long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? For if Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an effort with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. So, and we said it weeks ago, right? Saul was the one, Samuel was the one to anoint Saul. So when Samuel saw Eliab, he thought this was kingly material. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not. Look not on his countenance or on his, or on his height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You know, and we've been saying it that God is a heart God. And it shows that even when we are able to look like, right? Even when we are able to look like a Christian, look like we're living right. You know, God is able to, to judge 
because God looks not at the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart. So we might put on our best suits and, you know, underneath our broad hats and we come to church, you know, and our life is not at the place, right? So when we, we come, we, and I say that we're not fooling anybody, right? Because God looks at the heart. So let's go back to verse 8. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, neither the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord had not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are here all thy children? And he said, there remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, withal, and beautiful of a beautiful countenance, and good to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Let's go back to the slide. So seven of David's brethren. So David was anointed king from a young age. And, and seven of David's brothers were made to pass before Samuel. But God did not choose them. God put, choose David. I want us to know that whatever the Lord has for us, it is for us. And it, 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 that's how it is. It cannot change. If it was left up to Samuel, Samuel would have anointed Eliab. But the Lord said, I have not chosen this. Amen. So Samuel said, I cannot go to anoint another king. If Saul hear me, Saul will kill me. But God said, do it this way. So when we look now at 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, 14 to 19, we get to understand how, a little bit of how, of how God works. I want us to understand that sometimes we think that the Lord is going to work a particular way. But God chose to work it a different way. The, the Bible tells us that as high as the heaven is above the earth, so are his ways, so far are his ways from our ways. And his thoughts above our thoughts. When we look at this passage... Verse 17, sorry, verse 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. This was after David was anointed. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, no one evil spirit from God troubled thee. Let, O oh mighty God, let now the Lord command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is cunning, who is a cunning player, and, and heart. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is come upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in plain, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, 
send me David thy son, which is with thee. So like I'm saying here, let me just make the first point here. We cannot study how God operates. Right? Saul wanted somebody to play. And the servant answered, I, 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 I know a son of Jesse that is able to play. And one would think that, know that God has rejected Saul and has now anointed David to be king. Right? God will now place David as far away from Saul as possible. But that's not how God works. God took David from the sheepfold and he brought him into the house of the king to be a servant. Remember now, the, the, the prophet, the prophet said to the Lord, if I go to anoint another king, Saul will surely kill me. Oh, Jesus. And God now took, God took David and put him in the house of the king. I, I tell you, we can't understand God. Sometimes we can't study him because this is how he works. And, you know, sometimes you might be in the workplace and it seems like hell is on the left and hell is on the right. Right? And God put you in a place and you wonder, what are you doing? Look here. This is how God works some of the time. You, can't, you, you cannot fathom him. You have to just trust him and just say, look here. You know, God, my life is in your hands. So now when we look at David's character, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 18 that we read, the servant of Saul said this about David, you know, and the servant of Saul was talking about the character of David. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing music, and a mighty, valiant, valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. In a nutshell, the servant sum up who David was. So the first thing is that he was cunning. He was cunning in, in playing music. It just really means that David was, was, was skillful in playing the music. You know, he can play a tune with his fingers. And this was what the king was looking for. And God gave David that skill so that he could be in the house of the king. He said David was a mighty Valiant man. When we say talk about mighty man, you know, we're talking about possess, possessing great and impressive strength. To get a good understanding about mighty men, when the Bible talks about the mighty man, and, and, and when you read through Samuel's, David, the, the, the Bible talks about the mighty men of David. And the scriptures for that, 2 Samuel 23, 8 through to 39, and 1 Chronicles, you know, talk about the mighty man, mighty men. A mighty man will attract other mighty men around him. And this was the case with David. Because David was a mighty man, he had the anointing, the spirit of God upon him. He attracted other mighty men other mighty men with him. These mighty men of David were some of the toughest men, military men. And they were credited with heroic feats like Joseph Bash Hebet, who killed 800 men in one battle with a spear. Second Samuel is 23, 8. There was another one named Eliezer who stayed on the battlefield when 
everybody else ran. This Eliezer stayed on the battlefield and fought with the Philistines until he until his sword was took to his hand. And Abishai, Abishai, this was a mighty man also that killed 300 men with a spear. And Benaiah. So when the man said, David is a, a mighty man, we get an understanding what the man was saying. This was even before we knew David as a warrior, which tells us that the man, the man knew something about David. Probably you would have heard that David killed the lion and killed the bear. But he said David was a mighty man. And then we talk about valiant man. We talk about possession or showing great courage or determination. Therefore, the servant of the king, of King Saul, was saying, this man is a strong man. He's a powerful man. He's a courageous, and he's courageous, and he fears nothing. This was even before we know David to slay his 10,000. That was the song that they sang, the lady sang in Israel. But the man said that David was a mighty and valiant man. Then hear what, hear what he said. Hear what he said now. He said this man is a man of war. Oh God. Talking about David man said, this man is a man of... He was saying to Saul, this person is a man of war. He's a man of battles. As long as you say war for the right thing. Yeah. This is why in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1, while King David was in hiding from King Saul, he was to a look. The Philistines are fighting against the city of Keilah and are looting the threshing floor. And he inquired of the Lord, should I go up? It was Saul's responsibility to protect the city. But because David was a man of war, David saw the Lord and said, look here, should I go up? And the Lord said, go up. So he's a man of battle. As long as you say war for the right reason, David was ready. This was a part of the reason he went to the battle while he was in hiding. He went to, he went to deliver the city of Keilah while he was in hiding. Then the servant said, he is prudent in matters. Meaning that he was careful and wise in handling practical mat matters. Exercising good judgment or the use of common sense. So if a person you can say a person is prudent in matters. Let's, let's use finances. You see, a person that handles his finances well and, 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 and is careful with how, with how they make decisions pertaining to their finances, use good judgment, then you can say the person is, is prudent in matter. So what the man was saying is that this man is prudent in matter and it was characterized by the use of wisdom in practical matters or in planning for the future. Then the man said, David, the Saul's servant, how oh, him know so much things about David? 
I am thinking that this man, from time to time, when he leave from serving Saul and went home, he was probably a neighbor of Jesse. And he would have probably been talking to Jesse and heard, you know, about David. And he would have probably watched how David operate to know so much things, to be able to say him all of these things to King Saul. He said that David is a comely person, which means that he was a nice looking person. He was handsome. And then the man said the greatest thing. The Lord is with him. We can also say that, look here, he's a godly person. And this Lord was with him was a spiritual experience. If we look back on 1 Samuel chapter 16, 13, after David anointed the Bible said that the spirit of the Lord came upon him. So the experience that the man was said, you know, this man is a godly person. The Lord was with him. It was because the spirit of the Lord was now upon David. What are the markers or what are the marks of, of, of showing that the Lord is with an individual? One of the mark is success, and success, it, it depends on how you look at it, because I will tell you that success doesn't mean that you have a big house up on the hill with a swimming pool. That doesn't necessarily mean success. But it can mean that you, uh, you, you, you have triumphed on your daily living when it comes to living for the Lord. Fever is another mark. Victory is another mark. And the blessings is another mark. So these are the mark that you can look at. And when you look through the life of David, you can see all this. You can see success. You can see fever. You can see victory. Saul tried to kill David how many times? And he could not have killed David because of fever. David was victorious many times because the mark of the Lord. God was with him. So let's look at the other slide. So we say that David was victorious in battles. Saul's so servant said that he's a man of war. David's victory came because the spirit of the Lord was with him. He did not came because David could fight, but it was because the spirit of the Lord was with him. David also acknowledged it and gave credit to the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 17, 45, and 46. But let us now look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, 32 to 37. Let us find that. And David said to Saul, so we are saying that David knew that it was because the Lord was with him why he was victorious. Before he faced Goliath, David acknowledged it and he gave God the credit. So when we look now at 1 Samuel chapter 17, 32 to 37, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fear him, feel him because Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. This was after Goliath came for 40 days and shouted, Send, he said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. 
Give me a man that we may fight together. If I win, then you serve me. But if you win, then we will serve your people. And this he did, the Bible said, for 40 days. Every day for 40 days, this giant came out and said, send me a man. All Israel at this time was trembling. They were in fear because of Goliath. And here is this lad that came to the king and said, king. When David came to him, you know, remember David was the one that played for him when the evil spirit came upon him. And when David came to him, he don't even know who David was. But he said, let no man's heart fail them because of him. That servant will go and fight him. And David said to Saul, and Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and am he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Seen, he had defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the power of the lion and out of the power of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So David said, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. David's victory came because the Spirit of the Lord was with him. I want to tell us that as people of God, our victory will come. Amen. And we're going to get there and I'm going to tell you that our victory will come when we maintain our walk with God. It was because the Spirit of the Lord was on David while David was victorious. So David on the battlefield, 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 46, David acknowledged it on the battlefield and he gave the credit to the Lord. The first battle that King Saul fought, he gave credit to the Lord. He said, no man shall die. But he gave credit unto the Lord. The other battles that he fought, nothing was mentioned about God. But here we see David acknowledged, gave credit to the Lord, that it was because of him why he had the victory. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, 45, and 45. Then David said unto the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He said, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. 
and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistine this day unto the folds of the earth and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth might know that there is a God in Israel. So David took no credit for himself, but he acknowledged, he acknowledged, oh glory to God, that the victory comes from the Lord. He said, the Lord will deliver me, the Lord that deliver me out of the power of the lion and the bear will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Even on the battlefield, he made mention of it. He said, you come to me with sword, shield, speak. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. So David knew that victory comes from the Lord. I want us to know tonight as people of God that we cannot give ourselves the victory. Victory is only guaranteed if we maintain a relationship with the Lord. It is only guaranteed if we remain in the Lord. So let us not think that um, as individuals we can live any and any way and think that we will have the victory. It can't have the victory like that. David's victory was summed up in 1 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 6. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought tribute, and the Lord gave victory. This is what this Bible is saying, you know. That the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. Let us not think that we can give ourselves any form of victory. It's not by might, nor by power. But it is by the Spirit of the Lord. And it was because the Spirit of God was upon David why he was victorious. But David also maintained a relationship with God. David maintained a relationship with the Lord. The Bible was clear that the victories were because of the Lord. So you might be wondering, you might be wondering, why is it that I am not victorious? Folks might wonder, why is it that I can't? You know, have the victory. I just feel, you know, when I start things, things just not working out. You know, I, I just feel defeated. You know, you, you spend your time crying because you just feel defeated. And you're wondering what is happening. I want us to know tonight that victory will only come when we walk with Jesus. So we can't walk any and any way. We can't live any and any way. We can't live, you know, uh, with one foot inside of church, so to speak, and one foot outside of church, and expect that when pressures reach us, we can't just say, boy, we're going to be victorious because God is with, with us. Not like that. We have to walk with the Lord. We have to dedicate ourselves with him. And God will give us the victory again and again. So the victory will only come when we walk with Jesus. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through him that love us. So you might be wondering, why, what am I doing wrong? I would suggest the first place to start at is to look at your relationship with the Lord. Where is uh, where are you in your walk with God? What's your relationship like with God? If you feel like you, you can't get over and you, you just feel you can't get any victory and look at your relationship with God, I guarantee you, I put it to us, that if we live the life that Christ wants us to live, 
then Christ will give us the victory. Amen. So somebody, victory will not come if we are not living right. When we live right, when we try our very best to live right, I guarantee under the Lord that you will be victorious. So the next thing, point that we want to make. So even though the servant of Saul made mention of all these things pertaining to David, what I want to point out to us now is that David always inquired of the Lord. I want us to know that we can't, cannot bother God too much. We cannot go to God too much about a particular issue. God wants us to come to him. God wants us to talk with him. When there are situations in your life, God wants you to come and reason with him. The inquiring of the Lord is a characteristic feature of David. The Lord, the feature is not seen in the biography of any other person in the Old Testament. Whenever David faced trial, especially with his enemies, he always asked the Lord, show me your will. Is it your will for me to go? What is it that you would have me to do? And each time he inquired of the Lord, the Lord was gracious and gave him a clear and definite answer. When we look at the life of Saul, we said Saul made an attempt to inquire of the Lord. Uh, we have gone through Saul's life and we have not read at one point where Saul inquired of the Lord and said, Lord, what is it that you would have me to do? But as the, the, the one time that Saul was about to inquire of the Lord, Saul called the priest, called for the Ark of the Covenant, and we went through it and we said that, you know, the, 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 the people of Israel, they always call for the ark when they are going to inquire of the Lord. And so I'll call for the priest, call for the ark of the covenant. And just as he was about to say, priest, inquire of the Lord, he heard the noise coming from the, the camp of the Philistine. And the, the king sent back the priest. But when it comes to David... It is a characteristic feature of David. David made it a point of duty to inquire of the Lord. So the first record of David inquiring of the Lord is found in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1 through to verse 3. Then they told David, saying, so, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite the Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David Men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Kila against the armies of the Philistine? So, King Saul. had neglected his responsibility to protect the city. And he was more interested in killing David. He was now seeking to take the life of David. 
But here was David in hiding. Here was David in hiding. And David inquired of the Lord. If he should go up to deliver the city. David was in hiding. But he loved this country. And desired to free it from his enemies. So he inquired of the Lord, Lord, should I go up? So David had some mighty men with him, you know. I just tell, I just read it, we just read it. What so the, 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 the things that some of these mighty men did. And David was with these mighty men, and they were saying that we are afraid here in Judah. Much more to go down to that city. Next slide. David inquired of the Lord another time. First Samuel 23, 3 to 4. And David men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah how much more than if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines. There were about 600 men with David, like I said. And these men did some heroic things. And they said, we are afraid here. This presented a real problem to David because the Lord says, go down to Keilah. But the men that should have gone down with him were afraid they were unwilling to go because they were in hiding. The Bible says that David inquired of the Lord yet again about the same matter. So this is what I'm saying, you know. So that if we are talking to the Lord about a particular thing, no doubt we will ask individuals what they think while we're, talk, while we're talking to the Lord. But we have got to understand and we have got to be willing to do the directive of the Lord. Because the directive of the Lord said to David, go down to Keilah to deliver the city. But the men that were with him were afraid. And David went to the Lord yet again. I am saying to us as children of the living God, there is no problem if we are not so sure and go to God a second time about the same matter. David went to the Lord and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistine into thine hand. You see, even though the men were unwilling, when David get the second word, David understood that these men would have eventually go with him because he knew that it was the Lord that says, go down and attack the Philistine and save Keilah. The Lord responded to David's inquiry a second time and promised David that he would save Keilah. This goes to show us that when we seek the Lord, he will answer us. Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistine into your hand. So, we don't bother the Lord if we are uncertain and go to him more than once about a particular situation. I am sure that as individuals, are, are, are some of our ladies, if a young man approaches you, you, you don't want to, to, you want to be certain, don't it? So, so if you go to God more now, it is not a problem. If you're uncertain, go to him, seek him, and wait on him to answer.
Amen. So David inquired of the Lord again a third time. 1 Samuel 23, 10 to 11. Then David said, so this was after David was now in the city of Keilah. He had delivered them from the Philistine. And now it was told to David that Saul was coming to the city to destroy the city for his sake. And David went to the Lord. David went, I hope we now understanding what I'm saying about going to the Lord. This is what God wants. God wants us to come and talk with him. You're having trouble at work. Everything you do at work just seems off. Even when you pray and say, God, you know that I'm going to. It just somebody just cause you to just lose your temper. You're angry, you know, but you sin not. And even when you're, when, when you're angry, you don't say anything out of the way you feel so bad. Because you're supposed to be representing the Lord. And it seems like the adversary has you, have your ticket. Talk to the Lord. So David inquired of the Lord a third time. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seek to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. He said, will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down? Your servant has heard. O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Once more, David cast all his cares on God. Observing his words, he is more concerned for the welfare of the city than for himself. He was more concerned about preserving the city than preserving his own life. The Lord graciously answered and said, He will come. So David, it, it, it's basically almost one scenario, you know. And David went to God one, two, three times. He delivered the city. He was in the city. And he heard that Saul was coming. And David talked to God again. And God said, Saul will come. David again inquired the fourth time. First Samuel 23, 12. He said, will the men of Keilah deliver me? So he asked God, God will Saul come? And God said, Saul will come. Because the man wants to know that. The man wants to find details. And... He said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. You see, oh, David talked to the Lord, put the details there. Will, they, will Saul come? Yes, Saul will come. Will they deliver me? Yes, they will deliver you. You don't want anything more than that. In, I think it was 1 Samuel 30, 8 and 9, David inquired of the Lord again. David inquired of the Lord again. And this was before he became king. This was before he became king. And, and, and David, constant seeking of the Lord, should speak to our hearts. We should never depend on others. Right? Even when we talk to others and hear their suggestions, we should depend only on the Lord for our guidance and protection. 
we always sing the song, where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will go. You have called me and I will answer. Once you are, yes, we will talk to others around us, but at the same time, we want to hear what the Lord have to say to us. And if he said, move to the left, that is what we should do. Even when somebody is saying, because the men of David were saying, like, look here, we are afraid here. In essence, they were saying that we're not going over there. But when the Lord said the second time, go, David went. And while David was in the city, he inquired of the Lord. It should speak to us as individuals. The often time that David inquired of the Lord. Again, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8. Verse 1 Samuel 30, verse 8. David again inquired of the Lord. And this was before he became king. Right? He said, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue for you shall surely overtake them. And without fail, recover all. At this point, the Amalekites had invaded David. David was in a Philistine country, and the Amalekites invaded it. Destroyed it, the place. The place was called Ziklag. And after destroying the place, they took the wives, they took the children, they took the livestock, they took everything that was there. This was David was coming from a battle, you know. And they took everything. And some of the mighty men that were there with David said, look here. My heart feels, me can't go over there. But there were some that was willing. And he inquired of the Lord again, should I pursue this troop? Question one, should I overtake them? And the Lord answered him. Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. David, just like the Bible says, just like the word of the Lord says, you shall surely overtake them. David went and he recovered everything. He recovered everything, even his wife. David recover everything according to the word of the Lord. Then the sixth time we read, David inquired of the Lord, 2 Samuel chapter 2, 1 to 2, and 2 Samuel 5, 17 to 19. This was after David became king that he inquired of the Lord, right? And we see the scriptures. So David inquired of the Lord. And it happened that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I? This was after he became king, right? Second Samuel 5 17 to 19. That's what we said, right? But when the Philistine heard that they have anointed David, Listen to this. King over Israel, all the, Phil, all the Philistine came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hole. To hole. And the Philistine also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephidim. Rephidim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up? To the Philistine, will thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. As children of the Lord, we must learn from the principles of inquiring of the Lord. We just mentioned some of them. Because like we said, 2 Samuel 5, 22 to 25, and 
2 Samuel 21, verse 1. David sought the Lord. Why am I spending so much time on this? At one of the time, there was a famine in the land. And David inquired of the Lord. Is it because of Saul, why the famine, Saul being bloodthirsty, why the famine is in the land? And the Lord said, yes. Because they killed the Gibeonites when they shouldn't have. Second Samuel 21, verse 1. And God told David that Israel was suffering because of Saul and what Saul did. Take the rest, David, take the rest of Saul's sons and give them to the Gibeonites. But there was a grandson that was left back, and we will get back, get to him. But what, why am I spending so much time on, on us seeking the Lord, of us talking to the Lord when we have situation? As children of the Lord, we must learn the principle. David, multiple inquiries, inquiry of the Lord revealed that he was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer. He was one who always intend to know God's will for his life. As people of God, we should always intend to know God's will for our life. Don't do like King Saul that called for the priest for a show. Because in essence, him calling for the priest at that time was, was that because he was far from God, he was trying to put on a show. But, but, but David was a man of prayer. He, he inquired of the Lord. David sought the Lord. And that is why in Psalms 34, 46, David could say, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Hey, Jesus. They looked unto him and were lightened. And their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his trouble. But David always it was a part of him going to the Lord for even the simplest of things. Some of these things, probably some of us would, would, would make our own call. But David find pleasure in going to the Lord. David's multiple inquiry of the Lord shows that he was a man that seeks the Lord before he acted. In order to make sure that he is doing the will of the Lord. This was one of the main reasons. This was one of the main reasons why he was called a man after God's own heart. The Lord said, this, these were the exact words that were written in the scripture. He said, I have found David, oh glory to God, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my command. Command is missing from, here, from there. So God said that about David, and David, David character says to us that he was a man that inquired of the Lord at all times, even for the simplest of matter, in the simplest of things. He sought the Lord. If we want to be considered as having a heart like the Lord, we must endeavor to do his will. If we want to be considered a servant of the Lord, we must endeavor to do his will. I would, brethren, that the Lord give us great to 
grace to emulate David's example and to cultivate the habit of always inquiring, of always seeking the Lord and waiting for his answer. The more we, the more we seek direction from God in prayer, and the more we desire to know his will, the more he is honored, and the more we are blessed as individuals. May we continue, may we cultivate the habit of always inquiring and seeking the Lord and waiting for his answer. If you don't hear, I am not certain, don't move, continue to hold on. But let us endeavor as children of God. It, it, it's not our will. Saul was self-willed. He was driven to please himself. David was not like that. He was driven to please the Lord. And if we want to be children of the Lord, if we want to, it to be said that, you know, we are of God's own heart, then we should set ourselves to do the will of God. How do we know the will of God? It is by seeking him, asking for his direction, and just like with David, Every time, every one of these scriptures that we read, when David inquired of the Lord, the Bible said, God answered him. Proverbs 3, verse 6, it says, In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. If it's a business venture, talk to God. If it's education, talk to God. If it's about migrating, Talk to God. If it's about a job situation, changing of job, talk to God. Acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. If it's about a spouse, talk to God. Don't tell yourself that you're on the shelf a long time and this is the last one that is coming. No, talk to God. And he will direct your path. So David spent the time. David spent the time to. David spent the time to, to, to seek the Lord. And I am encouraging us. I'm encouraging us to spend the time to seek the Lord. So again, we look at another. Of David's character. David was a man of his word. David was a man of his word. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, 14 to 17. I think we, we, we have to find that one. 14 to 17. We see where David promised Jonathan that you know he would not cut off his love from the house of Saul after Jonathan was gone. I would like us to know that even when we look in further in 2 in, in second, second Samuel, 1 Samuel, sorry, we are going to see where David could have killed Saul. And Saul, when David came and he confronted Saul and said, Saul, I could have killed you. The Bible said that Saul wept. And saw hear what come, came out of Saul's mouth. Saul said, no, I am certain that you are going to be king. When you are king, do not cut off my name from the land. This was Saul saying this to David, you know. So, so David promised Saul, and David promised Jonathan. And thou shalt not only, while yet I live, Show me kindness, show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not. But also, thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord had cut off the enemies of David, everyone from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying 
let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemy. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. So David and Jonathan had a special relationship. And Jonathan knew that even though his father was trying to kill David, that David would someday become king. Right? And he made a covenant with David. They had a special relationship, you know. And they, they were good friends, as, like brothers. Uh, they had a special relationship. And Saul, sorry, D Jonathan caused David to make a covenant with him, saying that he will not cut off his love from his house. So David was a covenant keeping man. After the death of King Saul, and Jonathan, David discovered indeed. So remember, even David passed over the remaining sons to the, the, the tribe. And they killed the sons. But there was Mephibosheth that David did not know about. And now David now probably was reminiscing and he, and he inquired, Are there yet any sons of Saul? Or is there anyone of Saul's house? That I might show them love. That I might show them kindness. For Jonathan's sake. So David discovered indeed that there was a son of Jonathan who was crippled at the age of five. And he's still alive. His name was Mephibosheth. Do not fear, for I will show thee kindness for your father Jonathan's sake. So David was a man of his word, and he showed kindness. He showed kindness to the house of Jonathan by taking Mephibosheth and putting him at the king's table. David was also kind-hearted. So he was a man of his word. Yes, made a promise to Jonathan, and he fulfilled that promise. David was also kind-hearted. Though David was a man of war, here we see another side of the warrior king. 2 Samuel 9, 6 through to 8. Second Samuel 9, 6 through to 8. So, first of all, he showed kindness. He, 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 he was a man of his word in the same breath. He was kind-hearted. So though David was a man of war, we said, we see another side of the warrior king. He was also kind-hearted. Right? So Saul chased David for years and made his life miserable. David, because of this, could have easily cut off Mephibosheth, but instead showed him kindness. No, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. You know why I do this? Because normally when a king take over, Anyone that is of the former king, the king would get rid of them. Because there should be no threat to his throne. So he fell in reverence before the king. And he answered, behold thy servant. And David said unto him, fear not. 
So David, I leave in the fear now. You know, so fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan's thy father's sake. And will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is this, thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? So David showed kindness to Jonathan's house through Mephibosheth. He did so by giving him all that belongs to his grandfather Saul. And he gave him a seat at the king's table. He demonstrated the kind of covenant love that John described. Let us not love in words or talk, but in deed and in truth. 1 John 3, 18. So like we've been saying, it was a common practice in those days that an incoming king would have killed any and any relative of the former king to negate any threat to his new found throne. Mephibosheth knew this, being King Saul's grandson. This was the consequence that was expected. Though he was expecting a sword, Though he was expecting a sword, he got a seat at the king's table. Oh, Lord Jesus. We are recipients of God's kindness. I want the church to know that similarly to how David showed kindness to Mephibosheth, it is in the same way that the Lord shows kindness to us. Romans 5 verse 8. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were undeserving of this kindness the Lord has shown to us while we were of another heritage. Christ died for us. We are the Mephibosheths in this story. And Jesus has not only restored us from judgment, but he has invited us to eat at the king's table as part of the family of God forever. What a privilege we have. We are no more bastards, but we are sons. We are no longer far from the commonwealth of Israel. But now in Christ Jesus, we have been bought, brought near through his blood. Brethren, brethren, I want us to understand. I want us to understand that as children of God, we are recipients of God's love. We are recipients of his grace. We are recipients of his kindness. David was kind-hearted to Mephibosheth. And in a similar way, God is kind-hearted to us. I don't know about you, but I am extremely appreciative of the fact that God sent his son to die on the cross for me. That I might have life and have life more abundantly. He didn't have to do it. But he did it. And I'd like us to understand that as people of God, a way of appreciating, you know, what God has done for us. You know, it's by living 
so that it is a demonstration to God that you know we really appreciate what he has done and what he is doing for us. Next week we continue. Think that we can wrap up next week. Uh, we probably just have about two more points about David's life. We want to look at you know David having respect for the Lord's anointed and we want to also look at how David treat when he was when he sinned and was confronted we went through how Saul was confronted and he denied it he said that he did everything you know he obeyed the Lord's commandment even when the prophet was saying that you did not and we want to look at how David treated with that and then we want to just brush up everything close off next week God's willing and we thank you for tuning in. God richly bless you. Just by way of announcement, Friday, October 28th, right? There will be all night prayer meeting. We meet online at 10.30 to 12.30 a.m., right? Individuals and family pray at home together offline at 12.30 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. Faith Chapel, Ascot will be having their Food Fest, see flyer for further details. Sunday, October 30, 2022, Sunday school will be held online starting at 8.30 a.m. For this Sunday only. This is due to circumstances beyond our control. One day children convention, this Sunday also, September 30th, and it begins at 10.00. 30 a.m. All are invited. Both adults and children are invited. And also we encourage you as usual to carry a friend. Then there is community canvassing and this will be held immediately after service within the nearby communities. All members are encouraged to give their full support. So bring your walking shoes. I know that we come with our spike heels. So bring your walking shoes and, you know, let us go canvassing this Sunday after service and invite folks within the nearby community to come and join us in our missions convention. God richly bless you. Thank you for tuning in. We pray that, you know, the Lord would have, would have given you a word. The Lord would have talked to your heart. And we pray that God will continue to bless you. Let us close off in prayer tonight. Lord, Heavenly Father, we magnify your great and your matchless name. We thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for what was said. Lord, we know that your words will not return unto you void, but you will send it out and you will cause it to accomplish what you will. We pray, mighty God, that you will continue to stir hearts and continue, great Jesus, to stir individuals. Bring us to that point, mighty God, where we will Com be completely surrendered to you. Lord, as we leave tonight, we pray that you go before us. We pray that you'll have your own way and that you take full control. Let your perfect will be done as we give you thanks right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>